<clears throat> okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all for for coming today uh, for uh, this round of consultations, dialogue between the Middle East Institute and the Frederick Eber Stiftung uh, from Germany. Uh, we have had um, an excellent conversation this morning uh, and uh, are delighted uh, that we'll be able to continue with this public event this afternoon. And so uh, to begin the, uh, the program, I'd like to uh, rec uh, recognize, welcome our friend Knut Deffelsen uh, from the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Knut? Thank you. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, and I'm particularly happy that you, Ambassador, agreed to come, and I'm also very happy that my friend Rolf Mützenich agreed to participate in, in this event. But first, I would like to take the opportunity to thank all of you for your interest in this debate where we're going to discuss shaping the future geopolitics and the Middle East. We, the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, are committed to transatlantic dialogue on, we will, on important political question and foreign and security policy is, of course, something very important. And we believe that despite all the difficulties that we have in our relationship right now and also uh, maybe disagreements, or we called it this morning, divergence uh, of views, that it is important to remain in a very engaged dialogue on, on the broad issues, but also on specific questions like Syria, like Iran, like Iraq, and many, many others, and of course, very important, also the Israeli-Palestinian uh, relations uh, and the possibility for a solution for that a very long-lasting conflict. And for us as the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, this is particularly important uh, because Friedrich Ebert, our patron, was the first democratic elected president of Germany, he was elected 100 years ago, and he tried at his time Obviously, you remember, if you recall the time, it was a very difficult time after the First World War. He tried to rebuild Germany and the bridge, the divide in Germany that existed at the time. And also he tried to build bridges in Europe. And that was what the Social Democratic Party at the time also tried to achieve. Unfortunately, these efforts were in the end not successful and Germany went on a path that was very disastrous. And so our, we are now very much committed for democracy, but also for good solutions, for good governance, for just peace and uh, diplomatic international uh, solutions for conflicts. So that's why we are very happy that we can work together with the Middle East Institute and have this discussion here today. And I just uh, would like to, to say two words also about Rolf Mützenich. Rolf Mützenich is a senior member of the German parliament. He represents the SPD on foreign affairs, on security, on humanitarian affairs. But he has also traveled a lot in the region that we have discussed because he's also a board member of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. And one more word also about the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. We have 120 offices uh, worldwide, and we do work also very intensely in the region. And outside, you will find a report that we have published, Youth in the Middle East and North Africa uh, Coping with Uncertainty. And you know, if, you, if that's of interest to you, you're welcome uh, to take a copy and, and generally you are, of course, welcome to stay in touch with us. We, very we organize many debates on many important issues. But now, with further ado, I would, one more thing I need to mention, that Rolf uh, has many uh, talents, is very experienced, uh, and he is a very smart guy, and he understands English, but he feels more comfortable 
to speak uh, in German, so we will use for his uh, part translation, so you will need, unless you speak German, the uh, headphones later on when he speaks. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Knut, and uh, and uh, appreciate it. And, and like uh, like you, the Middle East Institute uh, highly appreciates the opportunity to work with uh, Friedrich Eber and to um, and to uh, further the the uh, issue of uh, communications between Germany and the United States. It's now my pleasure to um, uh, welcome the acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, for uh, Near Eastern Affairs. Really, she is the Principal Deputy, but it's, uh, it's uh, David Staple's fault that she's only acting. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, to, to welcome uh, Ambassador Joan Pulachek, uh to, uh, to begin uh, this, uh, this conversation, and Joan, um, uh, an old and uh, good friend has had a very distinguished career uh, with the State Department. She's currently um, uh, a career minister counselor. Uh, she has served most recently abroad as our ambassador to Algeria. Um, prior to that, uh, she was um, uh, spent uh, a long time working on Libya. Uh, and distinguished herself in, um, in that capacity uh, and also has served as the director of the Office of Egypt and Levant Affairs, Israel and the Palestinians. Um, she was uh, DCM in, in Tripoli uh, and the regional refugee coordinator uh, based in Amman, Jordan. So uh, Joan knows um, something about just about every corner of the Near East and many other things as well. So uh, please uh, uh, help me in welcoming Joan Pulachek. Thank you, Jerry, for that very warm introduction. It's a great pleasure to be with you this afternoon, and I thank you for inviting me to open this uh, discussion. As you all know, our European allies are critical partners in advancing our shared national security interests in the Middle East. And it's a real honor for us to hear today from Rolf Mutzenich. While the title for today's panel focuses on geopolitical divergence, I would argue that despite occasional headline-grabbing policy differences, our approach to the Middle East and North Africa is rooted in a strong convergence of interest not only with our allies in Europe, but also with our allies and partners in the region. I also would argue that, in spite of clear differences in their approaches to the region, there are opportunities to work with Russia and China to promote peace and stability. For example, despite our differences with Russia, we have worked together in Syria to establish ceasefire zones, allowing us to focus on our common interest in defeating ISIS and preventing a wider conflict. The challenge, of course, is to leverage that kind of seemingly one-off cooperation into a sustainable, productive dialogue. But before we plunge into the geopolitics, let's take a look at the profound changes underway in the Middle East and North Africa. Eight years ago, the eruption of popular uprisings throughout the region revealed a deep-seated desire for a better life. Despite the instability that emerged in subsequent years, the people of the Middle East and North Africa continue to demand leadership that can fix dysfunctional political systems and address long-term socioeconomic pressures. Meanwhile, states struggle to provide acceptable levels of service to their growing population and jobs to millions of youth looking to start their lives. Over time, the biggest threat to regional stability and security will be the ability of governments to deal with these socioeconomic pressures. 
This is not a problem that the United States or any one actor can solve alone. It's a challenge that requires all of our partners to share the burden of building regional security, stability, and opportunity because it serves all our interests. As Secretary Pompeo made clear last month in Cairo, the administration is committed to working with partners to tackle our shared priorities. He said, our aim is to partner with our friends and vigorously oppose our enemies because a strong, secure, and economically vibrant Middle East is in our national interest and it's in yours as well. What does this mean in practice? Our approach to burden sharing is not about America retreating from the region and doing less. Instead, our goal is to ensure that our partners have the capacity to do more. In Cairo, Secretary Pompeo said, we will continue to assist our partners in efforts to guard borders, prosecute terrorists, screen travelers, assist refugees, and more. But assist is the key phrase. We have long asked our partners in the region to demonstrate more leadership and responsibility in contributing to regional security. The Middle East, Middle East Strategic Alliance, MESA, is a key part of that vision. We seek an alliance that advances regional stability, security, and prosperity through enhanced multilateral cooperation in the political, economic, energy, and security spheres. Not only will MESA build a strong foundation for countering Iran's malign influence, but it will enhance our partner's capacity to be positive contributors to regional security. Our vision of partnership and greater burden sharing was on display in recent weeks as Secretary Pompeo hosted two important events, the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS Ministerial and the Warsaw Ministerial <laughs> to promote a future of peace and security in the Middle East. Earlier this month at the Coalition Ministerial, we have celebrated the approaching territorial defeat of the ISIS Caliphate. The coalition is a testament to what we can accomplish when we work together toward a common goal. Today, nearly all of the territory ISIS once held is liberated. The 74 nations and five international organizations in the global coalition are, and should be, enormously proud of this achievement. Our allies and partners have launched an unprecedented military, stabilization, counter-messaging, and law enforcement effort to prevent attacks against our homelands and counter ISIS's evil ideology. Last week, President Trump announced that a few hundred US troops will remain in Northeast Syria as part of a multinational force made up primarily of NATO allies to prevent an ISIS resurgence. Our goals in Syria have remained consistent. We are committed to the dismantling of ISIS, a political resolution to the ongoing conflict in Syria, and the complete withdrawal of Iranian forces from Syria. We will not provide US reconstruction assistance for areas of Syria held by Assad until Iran and its proxy forces withdraw, and until we see irreversible progress toward a political resolution. Only by working together in support of the UN-backed political process can we end the conflict and address the issue of the millions of refugees who have fled Syria. In Iraq, the United States will help the Iraqi government as it builds a united, prosperous nation with strong institutions to ward off corrupt external agendas. The coalition respects Iraq's sovereignty and remains committed to enabling the Iraqi government to battle the remnants of ISIS helping Iraq reach its full potential as a stable, prosperous nation is a goal the United States shares with many other countries in Europe and the region. Two weeks ago in Warsaw, Secretary Pompeo outlined our vision of how we can work together to achieve peace and security in the Middle East. Iran stood at the center of that discussion. The responsible members of the international community share the view that Iran's policies are destructive. Iran is the world's leading state sponsor of terror, spending billions supporting terrorist groups and proxy organizations that stoke regional conflict. 
It also continues to develop and test ballistic missiles in defiance of UN resolutions. The administration adopted a policy of maximum pressure to encourage Iran to change its behavior. We appreciate the strong efforts of our European partners to press Iran to curtail its malign activities. These efforts include EU sanctions in response to Iran-backed ter back terrorist and assassination plots, uh, German actions to ban landings of Mahan air flights, thank you for that, and the United Kingdom's addition of Iran-backed Hezbollah to its list of terrorist groups, making it clear that there is no distinction between Hezbollah's military and political wings. At the same time, we are increasing our own efforts to resolve regional conflicts that, if left unaddressed, create openings the Iranian regime can exploit. We also are united with our European partners in our efforts to end the conflict in Libya. The threats posed by ISIS Libya and Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb have been significantly rolled back. Libya needs a stable and unified government to reduce instability and violence. Together, we support UN Special Representative Ghassan Salame as he helps Libyans chart next steps on their constitutional and electoral processes. Finally, this administration continues to work toward a comprehensive and lasting peace between Israel and the Palestinians that offers a brighter future for all. The administration will, at the appropriate time, announce our vision for peace. We hope that people keep an open mind and judge it on its merits. I would add that we're already seeing some important progress between Israel and Arab countries. Warsaw brought together leaders from Israel and the Arab world to engage on common challenges. Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt are in the Middle East this week, building on Warsaw's momentum through consultations with key stakeholders on the economic component of the administration's vision for peace. More open engagement will be critical to achieving progress on Israeli-Palestinian peace. Secretary Pompeo affirmed in Cairo that the United States will continue to lead on Middle East security issues as a force for good in the region. But we will not, and frankly, cannot lead alone. We stand ready to work with our partners who have the courage and leadership to address the challenges we face and are ready and willing to make a positive contribution to regional peace, security, and stability. And in doing so, we have no closer partners than our European allies. Thank you again to MEI for the opportunity to hear from Bundestag member Mutsinish on these issues. I regret that I won't be able to stay for the panel, but I look forward to watching it later. So thank you again for this opportunity, and I'll now turn the floor back to Jerry. the member of the German uh, Bundestag. And so uh, to, to, uh, to lead that conversation and... Uh to the podium, uh, Karen, as you know, uh, is the, uh, the editor of the Washington Post Global Communities, Global Opinions even. <laughs> Uh, a section in the paper, uh, and is a uh, recent, uh, as in last week, uh, recipient of the Polk Award uh, for uh, the work that she has done at the Post, uh, covering and uh, reporting on the uh, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi and uh, and other issues. So. Uh, without further ado, let me ask Karen to come up and uh, we will launch our conversation from there.
can just get straight into the panel, into the okay. conversation, right? So if you gentlemen could join me, I'll sit here. Thank you. Um, I suppose you need no introduction. Um, no, I'll, I'll sit on the edge. Or you want to sit on the edge? You know, the cutting edge of, <laughs> of everything. Is that all right? Great. Great. Uh, well, um, I want to start off by saying thank you to uh, for inviting me and to the Middle East Institute um, as well. I am a late fill-in um, for probably my more qualified uh, colleague in the media from the BBC, but I will do my best. Um, I think what we are envisioning today is really, again, just a guided conversation on everything. You guys have been through a full day program, as I understand. And so just a, a general conversation and reflection on what um, you've discussed today, what we've just heard from um, Ambassador Polipchik. And we can start off from there, and then there'll be time for audience questions, which, again, I'm sure will be uh, enlightening and riveting. So. How about I just get started with something quite broad, um, and then we can focus and go maybe micro from there. Um, and I'll start. Uh, I'll start with with you, um, Jerry. <laughs> I mean, what do you see as? And I know we're we're talking about a region and talking about issues that are as broad as uh, Syria to Israel, Palestine, of course, um, Saudi Arabia, Iran. Um, from your perspective and your, your experience, I mean, how would you describe the key priorities for the United States? And how would you see the, the similarities or differences in uh, the German approach, or German or maybe broader EU uh, priorities? Um, <laughs> uh, thank Small you, Karen. <laughs> it, it, it is, a, it is a, a, a challenge, but let, sure. me, let me just say, uh, one of the things that we talked about this morning, of course, was looking at where the Trump administration mm -hmm. is in terms of U.S. policy. What are the priorities of the Trump administration in terms of, uh, one, uh, defeating uh, the Islamic State and, uh, and uh, violent extremism around the world? Uh, secondly, in containing Iran. Uh, and uh, particularly in terms of the, uh, their uh, ballistic missile programs, uh, their interference in the internal affairs of their neighbors, uh, and also, of course, support for terrorism. And we heard Ambassador Polachik uh, talking a little bit about uh, uh, concerns that we have about Iran as, as a major uh, sponsor of uh, global terrorism. Uh, and then, of course, the third one uh, that would be uh, the uh, trying to advance the so-called deal of the century and, uh, and uh, seeing whether there is not a prospect for um, an end to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that's gone on for so many generations. And so these are the, uh, the issues that the administration has <coughs> identified um, as its priorities. Uh, and then uh, there are a number of different uh, uh, sub-issues that come out of that. So, for example, uh, within the context of confronting Iran, uh, you also uh, need to talk about uh, uh, the conflict in Yemen uh, in terms of challenging the Islamic State, defeating the Islamic State and violent extremism. Uh, there is the, the question of uh, how we're going to approach uh, Syria, how are we going to approach uh, the, uh, the uh, stability issues in Iraq. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, as uh, uh, the ambassador said, uh, we also have today uh, Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt uh, traveling in the region who are looking primarily for the role that the Gulf states are going to play in trying to advance the issue of ending uh, the, uh, the uh, dispute between or the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. And so, uh, so you know, within those three pillars, uh, you have a broader strategy of how this administration, how the U.S. government at this particular moment 
is going to try to promote security and stability in the region. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and these are all important issues. Now, as you said, we had an opportunity, and I don't want to speak for Rolf, who uh, uh, is actually quite uh, uh, able in English or German to speak for himself, uh, but, uh, uh, but to just say that, um, that while there may be broad agreement between the United States and Germany on many of these issues, that there may be in fact, a similarity of views on some of the challenges that we confront, uh, that uh, when you get down to the specific tactics uh, that, uh, that we're pursuing, uh, what is the uh, US approach in the age of Trump versus what is the German approach on issues, for example, of confronting uh, Iran. Uh, I think that it's safe to say uh, that uh, that, uh, for example, I don't think that there's a disagreement between the United States and, and Germany or our European allies about what the, uh, the, the Iranian challenge is to regional security and stability, but clearly uh, there is a difference of views about uh, issues related to how we go about addressing those challenges, uh, you know, certainly in terms of the JCPOA, uh, and uh, and uh, the question of whether or not uh, it's correct to be pursuing, as the administration is, a much greater um, uh, a policy of, uh, of reimposed sanctions, or whether it's better to try to engage the government of Iran and see whether uh, we can convince the Iranians to, to move forward. Um, and uh, and on, on some of these others, uh, I think that uh, perhaps in, in terms of the Middle East peace process. Uh, again, I would say that uh, you know certainly I don't think there's any disagreement between the United States and Germany about what the ultimate objective is uh, of uh, you know achieving a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, but I suspect that there may be uh, some differences of opinion about whether or not uh, the administration was correct in its decision to. Uh, to uh, formalize a recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, uh, whether it's correct, and I know that our friends in Germany have done a lot to try to step in and, um, and replace uh, the funding for UNRWA that, uh, that the United States cut off. Uh, and that's a, a question, you know, is there, uh, it, w what is the correct approach to encouraging Palestinian Engagement. So all of these are issues, I think, that we discussed uh, this morning and that are worth uh, greater uh, consideration. So, Rolf, uh, as, as Jerry just said, you know, there's a lot of views that are very similar, goals uh, when it comes to certain priorities in the Middle East that are very similar, but perhaps strategies uh, that are different. Um, do you want to go into to the, uh, what you see as, as the, the German approach to some of these uh, strategies and where we do have differences? Uh, many thanks. I'm not quite sure whether, whether there is such a thing as one German voice, whether I can be that voice uh, regarding the strategic challenges for the Near and Middle East. But uh, I, I, I'm confident that I can share with you my own thoughts and considerations and share them with him. And I'm very pleased since we, uh, during this, uh, this security conference in Munich, did, uh, did listen to speech by Vice President Pence where there, where the, the the partnership w w was not expressed only by that, that we 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 are supposed to contribute our own strategic thoughts. I think it is very appropriate, and I would like to uh, mention that I really agree that that the what the ambassador mentioned here that one of the one of the really important challenges and also uh, approaches of the participation in order to solve the crisis in the Indian Middle East is especially the legitimate demands of a majority of the population to participate in the social and economic progress 
that we are able to fulfill that promise, and that's what the ambassador was addressing. And I don't think you can do that with, with grandiose armament business deals, but only by, by encouraging the governments of the region to have, have the kind of covenants and that it particularly supports the people and particularly gives perspective to the young people. Um, I, I won't say that we, we have the only right answers to these questions, but uh, especially yesterday there was a summit of the, uh, the Arab League there was a public dispute on the issue of human rights in Egypt you know, that, uh, that occurred at the end of the and representatives of the European Union on the one hand and on the other side there was a representative of the Arab League. That for us in Europe it is really important that human rights are one single criterion for, for these aspects and the second aspect, and I admit it very openly, we also have a dispute within the European unit uh, on, on the question about the, the, the exports of arms to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And uh, at, at, the, at the very latest, our, our chancellor decided that after the murder on, on uh, Khashoggi, that Germany no longer would export armaments to Saudi Arabia. And that was uh, against the protest of our French and, and British partners. Maybe these are these are two points I'd, I'd like to mention about these two countries. And in fact, we also see that Iran in the in the region that's that is actually a region that's neighboring Europe it, it, it is showing behaviors that is that it does not serve to solve the conflicts but it it it, it stimulates conflicts the the problem uh, however still is that we we have to acknowledge that at, at least the, the, the elite in Iran is uh, is convinced that they continue to be under pressure from the international community, especially under pressure from the U.S. government. They, they have to work in, in, in their, their own the right to existence of the government, of the regime of Iran, and the system of Iran is, is drawing that into, into doubt. And it is my impression that Iran and it is not it's, it's not isolated in international politics they believe that their own that they can only provide for their own security by by there are so 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 many factors of disquiet outside of the borders that they have to concentrate on the challenge of it. that sounds a little complicated but seem that seems to be an equation which we which we also had later early on during the cold war and we having said that we really have to we have to try because we don't have have grandiose uh, solutions we can offer for the we, we have to try through humanitarian aid to help people um, and, and uh, people who fled Syria and Iraq the German Bundestag is every every year uh, giving two million two billion euros in humanitarian aid and on the other hand we do hope that we uh, we have by by providing of, of so social a uh, social existence for refugees we can make a contribution to the really great devastations to, created by wars in the near and middle east not only in syria but also in iraq and also in yemen and we are, we are showing that on the hand that one response also to isis may be a military response and has to be a military response but at the end of the day isis can only be overcome if we in the societies which give rise to isis we we have our economic and social participation of of all people. I, I noticed a very interesting, I mean, shared responses, but also differences in your responses as far as priorities, which is natural and healthy and good. But one thing, I know, obviously, um, particularly for me in representing the Washington Post, I would be remiss in not <laughs> bringing up and addressing the uh, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi mm -hmm. and the reaction um, in Washington compared to we'll, we'll start with just Germany since uh, since that is the focus for today and I, I briefly read the note uh, your note on this how 
um, you know, a key ally of, of the United States is pretty much facing its worst international <laughs> PR crisis, at mm -hmm. the very least, mm -hmm. um, in decades. Mm -hmm. um, so to Rolf, your, your mention of, of, of human rights and, and values as to uh, uh, part of the decisions or the reason to, to stop armaments, um, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, can we, I guess, get into that? Um, Gerald, I mean, I think what has partially shocked a lot of people uh, about the, uh, the aftermath of Jamal's mm -hmm. uh, of killing was it was really a time where the American people were looking at our, our relationship um, mm -hmm. with Saudi Arabia. How do you see this playing out, continuing to go forward? Um, as far as our relationship with Saudi Arabia and whether or not they, the country can be uh, relied upon to play a positive role in the region? Well, it's a very good question, uh, Karen. And, and of, of course, I, I think it is uh, perhaps the question that really cuts to the heart of the debate that we've seen um, uh, in, uh, in the United States and, and certainly here in Washington over these past uh, four or five months since uh, uh, Jamal's murder. Uh, and that is, you know, is where, where is Saudi Arabia today? And, and of course, uh, I'm, uh, I'm old enough <laughs> to, uh, to uh, remember many of the times where the United States and Saudi Arabia worked extremely closely together in order to achieve uh, common goals, security and stability in the region. Uh, the work that we did in the 1950s and the 1960s uh, to contain the expansion of uh, Soviet uh, communism. The, uh, the work that we did together in the 1980s uh, to confront uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and uh, to ensure that that got rolled back and the Afghan people had an opportunity uh, to determine their own uh, futures for themselves. And so uh, uh, there is a long history of close cooperation where I think it's safe to say that regardless of the fact that our systems are entirely different, our perspectives on the, on the relationship between uh, governments and citizens are entirely different, uh, values that we express in, in many of our fundamental institutions are very different and yet nevertheless uh, at, the, uh, at the level of trying to achieve um, uh, policies that uh, supported the stability of the global economy, that supported regional security, that supported, you know, the, uh, the shared objectives of both of our uh, societies, uh, that, um, that uh, fishing here, um, that, uh, that, that the United States and, and Saudi Arabia um, uh, were able to work together productively and constructively. And so the question that we have today uh, and again, I think that you, you put your finger on it. It is the question that's at the heart of, uh, of this debate, and that is, are we still in a situation where the United States and Saudi Arabia, given uh, the, the fundamental different perspectives that we each bring to the table on many of these issues, are we still pulling in the same direction on, uh, on fundamental policy issues, security, stability, <coughs> Uh, the global economy, the stability of the energy markets uh, for, uh, for everybody in the world, and, um, and how does that translate into specific policies? And of course, um, you know, Yemen uh, being uh, one of the most immediate ones. Now, for me, I have to say, uh, again, that based on my experience, I would say that we do have that ability to work together, uh, that, that I don't see a change in the, in the way that Saudi Arabia looks at the region versus the way that the United States looks at the region, that we would like to achieve the same objectives. We obviously, we share a concern about Iranian behavior. Uh, we share um, a commitment to uh, global economic security. We share a commitment, I think, to moving forward on resolving the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And of course, uh, uh, Kushner and Greenblatt are, are in uh, Riyadh, they're looking at many of these issues together. And I think that we need to understand what Saudi Arabia is and what Saudi Arabia isn't. Um, and, and I want to go back to a point that, that Rolf made, which I think is an important one, 
and one where I would say that I, I regret some of, the, uh, some of the decisions that the Trump administration has made and some of the direction they're pushing in. Because I think that Rolf said quite correctly that the, um, that the civil rights and human liberties uh, uh, or, or uh, human rights and civil liberties are essential for domestic stability and security. And the question that we have, the issue that we have right now is that um, unfortunately the Saudi uh, government, the Saudi leadership has moved in a direction where uh, we have real questions about what their attitude is. And the Jamal Khashoggi issue is not um, is not, doesn't exist in a vacuum. Right. The Jamal Khashoggi issue exists within the context of how does the Saudi leadership see its relationship to its people? Mm -hmm. And what are the rights of the people to speak? Uh, what are the rights of the people to uh, express uh, opposing views on issues? Uh, and, and, uh, and what are the responsibilities of a government to permit that and to, uh, and to uh, you know, embrace that? Uh, and so uh, in, this, uh, in this context, and, and Ambassador Palachuk talked a little bit about the Cairo speech uh, from Secretary Pompeo, and the fact of the matter is that uh, Secretary Pompeo, I think, made an unfortunate statement saying that the United States really isn't interested in human rights and civil liberties, mm -hmm. that, uh, that we view our relationship as a relationship between states and between leaders, and that is really where we are going to put our emphasis. And my own experience is that that's a mistake in the long term, because at the end of the day, we have to uh, rest our uh, relationships, our, our interests, on the willingness of populations, the willingness of societies to work with us and to cooperate with us. And, uh, and if we ignore um, societal demands, population demands, and only look at the relationship with a leader, uh, then uh, we end up, uh, I think, in a, in a, a cul-de-sac. So um, I would really much prefer to see the United States be more outspoken on, is on these issues, human rights, civil liberties, uh, and, uh, and that, I think, would address many of the concerns that we have about Saudi policy. More broadly, I think that we should continue to cooperate. We need to continue to cooperate with the Saudis on achieving the broad objectives of U.S., Middle East policy. Uh, but I do think that we need to be a little bit more aggressive, as I believe the EU is uh, being a little bit more aggressive, in, in explaining why we think that these issues are so important and why we think that these issues are uh, ones where we need to express ourselves mm -hmm. and involve in the internal affairs. Yeah. Um, I, I'm thinking even now as we speak about the I don't know exactly how many days it's been, but the uprisings in Sudan. Mm -hmm. um, and here we are eight years uh, after the Arab Spring and after what I think many um, Arabs, including Jamal Khashoggi, saw as their hopes for more opening, mm -hmm. more freedom, more mm -hmm. uh, responsive to the people. Mm -hmm. Those hopes were dashed, I mm -hmm. think, for a lot of Arab mm -hmm. people. Um, so. What we're seeing in perhaps in Sudan, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the, the leaders of the region of the Middle East are, are looking at that extremely closely. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, it's a symbol for the entire world that at some point, uh, peoples will want and will demand space. Right. Um, and so it's a question of, again, with uh, Europe, uh, and in particular, uh, uh, Germany, um, taking a, a stronger at least public stand when it comes to standing with peoples. Um, granted, uh, again, um, the, the issues are complicated, but I guess I, I wanted to, to, I guess that sounds like a sort of the fundamental rhetorical split, stability, security, shared interests, and terrorism, uh, not necessarily versus, but not always in concert with uh, freedom and openness and, and political space. Um, is, is, is should the U.S. Uh, or even Europe, I, I think we've seen uh, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in the last uh, even few days, few weeks, traveling through uh, India, Pakistan, mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. um, is this, uh, uh, Rolf, I'll, I'll, I'll position, this, position this to you. How is Europe perhaps seeing uh, 
the um, emergence of perhaps other partners in some ways for uh, these leaders in, in the Gulf and in the Middle East uh, is that looked upon as a threat, as competition, or, or just can you maybe talk a little bit uh, more about that? I'm afraid ultimately it's everything. It's competition. It's um, perhaps competition is a more positive statement. On the other hand, it's also the reality of international uh, order where countries of the Near and Middle East and of the Arab Gulf and probably also the leading politicians are going to be the leaders uh, in globally over the long term and that they don't raise um, human rights as the first issue is something that is understandable and perhaps for one or the other traveler that's uh, rather positive. On the other hand, I do see that many people in the Middle East who are basically neighbors of Europe and I think they see it as a gain for themselves that they can um, that they can realize their own desires. And here, I'm very grateful um, for the exchange of young people between Europe and the Arab uh, nations because they live close to each other and they have uh, social media to communicate with each other, and they can clearly show that at least towards the outside, they see that Europe has taken a stronger position with respect to human rights and political freedoms and liberty than the current governments of the American uh, um, and in the United States. But I think um, it just reflects uh, what has been said in Washington with respect to those issues. And of course, in Europe, we ask ourselves repeatedly whether we try to actually cash in on human rights or whether we actually just use words, just have rhetor rhetorical issues. And so I'm really grateful that there is a discussion in uh, your Congress of emphasizing the role of the parliaments uh, in causing their own administrations to change the position. I think, for example, stopping exports of arms uh, to Saudi Arabia was not something that uh, the German government uh, decided on. But um, instead, during the negotiations of a new coalition government in Berlin, this issue was raised and the chancellor in 2017, even before the last election, was, had visited Saudi Arabia and had not been extremely critical and she was praising the new policy. But I think that the Crown Prince has the interest of young people in mind and he tries to get a broader basis for economics in the country, or at least that's what he was talking about. But of course, there is a contradiction. If you permit women to drive, and this is uh, publicized in the media and everybody is excited about it, that this is the evolution in Saudi Arabia. But those women who earlier on had tried to promote this right are then arrested and are thrown into prison. So there's a contradiction there. And of course, this contradiction then has to be raised. And we encourage our head of government to actually uh, pursue these issues. But let me perhaps point out that I think there is a transatlantic dispute or a disagreement between the U.S. government on the one side and at least some of the European governments. And I can state that we think that the deal, as it is often uh, called lately, that the deal with 
Iran is something that is better internationally and globally that is trying to uh, restrict the use of nuclear energy for weapons. I think uh, that the uh, JCPOA was a very big achievement. And I think there is a fundamental difference in the interpretation of how you use foreign policy tools on the one side by European governments and on the other hand by the US government, which is willing uh, or seems more willing to tear up um, treaties of the past, such as the INF, without being able to replace it with something else. I have nothing against questioning previous treaties or agreements, but I think you always would have to have an alternative that you offer for security policy. That is, when it's always better to have an agreement rather than uh, than not having something. Replace it. Alex, that is, that is interesting. Again, um, I think that's also a, an undercurrent of this as well mm -hmm. in, in terms of multilateralism, a policy and approaches, multilateral approaches that Europe needs, mm -hmm. frankly, versus perhaps what we've seen in this administration as a more unilateral, more um, in some ways, sometimes isolationist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, approach with the exception of um, its uh, approach to Iran, trying to get a sort of coalition mm -hmm. uh, uh, against Iran. Is that something that, um, again, is, is part of the issue, part of, part of the problem? I mean, perhaps our European partners see that at least under this administration, a sort of more go it alone or, or unilateral uh, uh, approach, tearing up agreements, withdrawing from deals, um, means that we're not as necessarily reliable as a partner for, uh, for stability in the region as we once were. Some might argue that yeah. we perhaps never were, but um, uh, yeah, I'd love to, to hear what you think about that. Well, I think that that's, uh, that, that's certainly um, a major part of the, uh, of the, the conversation, the, the, the uh, disagreement between uh, the United States and our, and our key allies in, in Europe. And, and that is, and it was interesting if I can, uh, if I can just refer back to mm -hmm. part of the conversation that we had today, because of course, I mean, as, uh, as Rolf said quite correctly, the, uh, the issue of withdrawing from the JCPOA, again, is part of a larger pattern, uh, withdrawing from the climate change agreement, withdrawing from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, uh, withdrawing from the INF Treaty. Um, uh, so you have an administration that, uh, that is uh, looking at these issues from the narrow perspective of, you know, does this meet uh, an immediate uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, advantage for the United States. How does this fit into a perspective of doing what's best for the United States in a very narrow con uh, construct? And you know, uh, again, when I was uh, uh, much younger, uh, you know, uh, we always used to say, I mean, you know, th this idea that, that past administrations didn't pursue, um, you know, U.S. interests, of course, we all know is, uh, is simply not right. Uh, every administration, I started with Gerald Ford. Mm -hmm. uh, I could have gone back and started with Franklin Roosevelt or, or Woodrow Wilson. It wouldn't have mattered. It's all, every administration, every U.S. Uh, government has always pursued what it considered to be U.S. interests. The difference is that in the past, the way administrations defined that interest was very different. Uh, and uh, in the way that the U.S. would have defined its interests uh, even uh, three or four years ago, uh, as well as you know, 30 or 40 or, or uh, 80 years ago, was looking at, at a broad-based um, uh, interest, an interest in uh, institutions, an interest in the transatlantic relationship, an interest in uh, building uh, structures uh, that, uh, that everybody uh, could embrace and, and uh, profit from. Whereas today we seem to be in a, in a moment where 
uh, where these uh, interests are very narrowly uh, constructed. And so, uh, so the issue isn't, you know, uh, does climate change benefit the world? It's does climate change benefit, you know, individual interests here in the United States? And if the answer, answer to that is no, then you uh, walk away from the agreement. So, uh, so there is this fundamental difference. But the thing that I think is most, most notable, and I think that as Americans, what we should be most focused on and concerned about is a comment that one of our colleagues made this morning, and that is to say, people who think that at the end of the Trump administration, whether that's in two years or in six years, we'll be able to take a sponge and erase all of this from the, you know, from the blackboard and say, never mind, we're going we're to go back to the way things were in 2016. Uh, that's not going to work. Uh, the, the reality is that, that decisions are being made, uh, uh, positions are being adopted on both sides, not just in the United States, but on both sides, which is going to make going back to a status quo ante uh, impossible. Uh, if, uh, you know, issues, for example, uh, on um, the impl uh, implementation of the sanctions regime and the, um, the, the frustration that many of our friends in Europe feel about the efforts of the administration to impose um, extraterritorial extra sanctions on European companies that are, in fact, doing uh, what is consistent with the policies of their own governments. Uh, on Iran, on trading with Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, are people looking at, uh, for example, alternative, um, uh, alternative uh, means of achieving that? So we have this special, uh, this, this special um, you know, facility uh, that the Europeans have adopted in order to, uh, in order to try to help their, gov uh, their uh, co uh, companies um, uh, work around uh, the U.S. sanctions. Those may not go away. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that many of the, uh, the issues that are now um, in, in debate, for example, uh, the use of the dollar as the global currency, uh, uh, could be under, under threat, under challenge in the future um, because of some of the decisions that are being made today. Mm -hmm. And those are decisions that, frankly speaking, have benefited the United States directly for uh, 75 years. So, so things are happening uh, that are going to be very difficult to repair in the mm -hmm. future, uh, even if you have an administration that comes in after this administration with a very different attitude. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think part of, part of the issue is, is, as they say, I mean, to a certain extent, geography is destiny. I mean, Europe's vision and, and view in, in many ways from, from what I've seen and read is that um, the instability or, or conflicts in the Middle East literally is on their doorstep. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, to a certain extent, we are removed by an ocean um, from these issues, whether we're, we're talking about refugees uh, whether we are talking about being uh, um, accepting, uh, seeing the spillover um, um, of these conflicts, so that that issue has always been um, intriguing to me. Um, maybe I'll, I'll have this as my last question or, or contribution, and I'll open it up. Um, we've talked a little bit about, or a good amount about policy interests, objectives, views. I'm interested in what is happening, what are the results, what are we seeing? And um, again, in, in the wake of, of Jamal Khashoggi's murder, of uh, talking with um, Arab uh, uh, friends of mine who basically say um, these arguments about stability, about security, about exchanging our rights because we need to have uh, stability today, we see Yemen Yemen is one of the worst humanitarian crises that this globe has ever seen. Um, and in that conflict in Yemen, despite the arms that uh, the US and the UK have provided with the Saudi and UAE coalition, um, they have not been able to stop the conflict and have not been able to contain Iran. It was something that, that Jamal wrote about. And we see Syria, no end in sight to mm -hmm. the carnage uh, mm -hmm. in Syria. And so I guess perhaps uh, uh, my question is, is, are we on a path to a, at all, 
to a stable and secure Middle East because I think a lot of people in the region don't see hope. <laughs> what hope would you have to give them in terms of our, our policies and in terms of our approaches right now? Is that me? Yeah, that's it. That's fortune ball, yeah. I suppose. But it's a real, it's a real uh, issue right now. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Uh, it's it's very very difficult to predict the future. I'm 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 I you know I'm trying to be reelected within my my electoral circle. I'm really I don't even know the outcome of that. Uh, well, the uh, possibilities are of course limited. I wish I I wish for the region that it finally will be in a position. To, among other things, also th through a receding preparedness of external powers to intervene. I, I do hope that in future it's going to be less, it's going to recede, and that they also become the opportunity or get the opportunity to to make progress in their own development. And we, we when, when we discuss this, we have to we have to focus on a few theses because uh, the uh, Huntington uh, wrote about the world after the Cold War, and it was as he described this as a collapse of civilizations. I never shared this thesis. I never shared this opinion. But I'm of the view that, especially the societies in the Near and Middle East, in fact, have a have a clash of civilizations, but a clash. In the in the internal in the internal spheres of their of their societies, they have read the question of political participation of social and economic rights of their populations, and that also the in the individual individuals in the societies also do have do have their their own rights and their entitlements, and I I believe that these. These conflicts are not in a way that they have to do something. What the U.S. has experienced through the Civil War and Europe has gone through, but that these are in fact internal conflicts that are are being pushed up through the participation of external powers. And on the other hand, unfortunately, there 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 is a there is a there is a fixation of hegemonial conflict in the region that at this point in time is very strongly between Saudi Arabia and the Iran on the other hand it's being played out between these two powers and I do think that the, the countries between Shia and Sunni is being used or abused in order to stimulate this uh, this conflict of the powers and from my perspective it would be necessary that we should try although when we are affected by what's going on in this region, that we, in the end, should not make a contribution that in, in order to, to, uh, to stimulate these conflicts. Um, because if you asked me, how, how, how will this region look? And, and I do hope that, that then for the people themselves, it will be better than the way it looks today. That is my hope. Well, uh, uh, just to say, uh, you know, I, I think that that we are in a posi in, in a period of, of huge transition um, in, inside these societies and and in terms of, of regional relationships. That is a transition in a positive direction. Well, uh, all transitions, I, I presumably, are positive. I don't think <laughs> um, I you, always you, say that, but <laughs> you know, um, uh, you. It's interesting because, um, uh, of course, uh, you know the the transition in Europe. I mean, 1848, uh, the revolutions in Europe, and and that really, the um, the aftershocks of the revolution of 1848 weren't resolved until after the Second World War. That that those that those issues that came up, um, you know, it took a, a century really for Europe to work through some of the challenges that arose um, in the middle of the 19th century. And so, in a way, it's, uh, it's really unreasonable of us to expect that these uh, issues will be resolved more quickly uh, or more easily in the Middle East than they were in, in Europe. And, and so, 
to a certain extent, I think that the role that we should be playing um, uh, as countries which have gone through many of these challenges, so we went through the Civil War, you went through um, a century really of, of conflict and, and instability, um, uh, that, that we can you know, help, uh, we can uh, uh, provide you know, some uh, insight from our own experiences on, on how to do this, uh, but we also need to expect and, and, uh, and accept uh, that we're going to be seeing many of these shocks uh, working through. We saw them in 2011 and 12 uh, in the Arab Spring. I think that, you know, uh, I think that we're going to continue to see them. I think that we'll see them in the Gulf uh, and uh, elsewhere in the region. And that these, uh, that these internal uh, dynamics, I mean, you could even go back and look at, you know, what, what is the after, you know, is, is this issue of uh, Saudi-Iranian competition an aftershock from the 1979 Iranian revolution? And, mm. and you know, did that set in motion you know, a, a chain of events that have led us to this particular moment uh, where we have, um, you know, these issues of sectarian uh, uh, competition and, and, uh, and power, uh, uh, really, competition in the region. So, so I, I think that, you know, I, I, would, I would go back and say that, you know, that transitions are inevitable. Uh, every society goes through them. Uh, it, it can be argued that we're going through one right now. Um, and, um, and, uh, and I think that, that it's not a question of is this a good thing or a bad thing. It's an inevitable thing. And we can try to help shape it in a way that works out positively uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the interests of those societies, of the populations, you know, the people in those countries, as well as how it uh, impacts uh, regional and global security and stability. Mm, sounds good. <laughs> All right, I guess we have time for few questions. I'm trying to eye my handlers to ha see how much time I have. But um, I'll just go ahead and get started. Maybe the gentleman on the very end with the, yeah, you, with the red shirt. And um, I'm going to Hello. enforce, I don't know, executive okay. moderator privilege <laughs> and ask that you keep your question just to one All question. Right. Um, and introduce yourself if you can. Uh, yeah, I think it was pointed out that Iran is uh, the deterrent of stability in, in the Middle East. But when you look at the historical record, uh, Iran has interfered, not interfered, but gone into uh, Iraq and Syria. But those problems have been resolved. Uh, it doesn't seem like a negative. It seems like a positive. The only other places Iran is considered interfering is in Bahrain and Yemen. But the legitimate grievances of those people would exist regardless of Iran. Now, if you take the U.S., well, we have Afghanistan. After 20 years, nothing resolved. The Iraq invasion uh, really caused a lot of turbulence in Iraq and led to the emergence of ISIS. We also have Libya. We have southern Sudan. We have Somalia. Uh, we have Kosovo. We have Bosnia. We're all areas where the U.S. interferes, and the situation has not been resolved. And of course, we also have the Israel-Palestine issue, where the Israel, where the U.S. has been involved since almost day one, and nothing resolved. Okay. So I, I don't see why you say Iran is the deterrent to stability in the Middle East, and why do you don't consider the policies of the U.S. <laughs> Well, so maybe, yeah, yeah maybe uh, that's what I'll do. I'll take like three or something at a time. Let me go over here. I'll, geographical diversity. I just have a straight question to Mr. Ambassador. Like you said that Germany supporting the human rights and the refugees and you guys are like offering a lot of money. Isn't it better for, for, for Germany specifically like to fight terrorism in the Middle East and to try to limit Iran role in the Middle East because the Iranian clearly are supporting like uh, uh, ISIS in Syria, Houthi in Yemen, I mean Hezbollah in Lebanon. So isn't it better for us to fight the terrorism in the ground rather than coming back and support like the human crisis and stuff? Thank you. 
Oh, I also wonder if you could int uh, introduce yourself also, if oh, you want. Yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> My name is Amr Gohar. I'm a journalist with Al Ain uh, Newsgate. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll take one more. Uh, the gentleman in the very back with the cap. Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. I, I'd like to direct this to Rolf in the first instance, uh, but anybody. But I remember way back in the early 90s uh, when President Clinton came in and after the Tiananmen, after, uh, Tiananmen uh, uh, disaster had happened in China, uh, Clinton made a speech and said, hey, look, hu human rights, whatever, that's going to be over here. Cooperation with China, economics, we're going to do that on a separate track. It's not going to be affected by any considerations of human rights. So in a sense, this goes way back. And my question to you is, from the German perspective, was that a total mistake of Clinton? Because even if you just take the economic thing, a lot of people say that was a mistake because it led to where China is today, uh, peer of the US. Uh, but but how, how, how was that received in Europe? And particularly given the consequences since then of that decision? Okay. So I'll, we have three questions. Um, let's see, is it better for Germany to fight the terrorism on the ground? Uh, German perspectives on, on um, past approaches to human rights and economics. I guess, Rolf, I will give it to you to address uh, any of these issues. I was thinking that I, in, in my remarks, would, would not, would not con constantly uh, focus on Iran. I, I was thinking that Iran is the only disruptive factor in the region, but in fact, Iran is 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 is, is playing an influential role. But it is a, a part of the region, and of course, pursues certain interests. Uh, and at least with the definition of an Islamic republic, that's uh, that's already sort of from the the name. It's it's very incongruous. Uh, an Islamic republic. That's a contradiction in terms. Because it 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 also it, it's a it's a long history of a of a major regional power in the region, and I believe that a part of its uh, of its participation in the Near and Middle East uh, has to do with uh, Iran's own security and safety. But on the other hand, also for instance, in the situation of Yemen, we do have the impression that in the beginning of the conflict, it was not at the beginning of the conflict in Yemen, but during the conflict. It was it was sort of against the confrontation. It was a scene again in the mirror of a confrontation between Saudi Arabia and Iran. I I don't think that this is an interpretation of how it would be viewed in Iran itself. But it's a but it's it's a. But let me just uh, remind of of the history. My contribution here today, and also what I do in Germany, is that that I, 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 I do criticize Iran uh, in a justified manner, but I also think that Iran has certain safety requirements, demands in the region, uh, rightful demands. And there are also certain, certain groups in the Near and Middle East that also bring insecurity to Europe. Uh, one, we would also have to try to keep them back with, with certain I, I do prefer the measures that are available. Uh, we, we have intelligence, and we have to disrupt financial transfers because these groups also uh, get their financial reputation through the sales of raw materials. Unfortunately, also through human trafficking, through trafficking uh, on smuggling of drugs. And I, it's it's not a, not first and foremost a military intervention, but Germany is participating in the coalition against ISIS. But I also have to say very openly that ISIS is not only uh, not only arose because uh, there, there was a situation in the near and Middle East that that was that was brought about through military conflicts. Unfortunately, it was also legitimized at the, at the very least after the intervention of Iraq, when a part of the population in Iraq uh, 
was was excluded from participating politically and economically and socially. And at that point in time, when we social democrats were in charge of the government in Berlin under Chancellor Schroeder at the time, we were absolutely against the U.S. intervention in Iraq. And that was not exactly received enthusiastically here in Washington. Uh, and I. I would say that we do have a panoply of different answers to certain situations. We have a variety of, of responses and reactions. On the other hand, I cannot see at, at all, and I'm, I'm doing this out of respect for the uh, domestic politics of the United States, uh, uh, to, to, to criticize the current government and certainly not predecessor governments. But we have to see, for instance, that we Social Democrats uh, under uh, the Chancellor Willy Brandt, Helmut Schmidt, also tried to have a policy of uh, disengagement, of relaxation during the Cold War, because we were of the conviction that 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 too was part of the contribution in order to overcome the challenges of the Cold War. On the other hand, and I, I, I absolutely up until his death, I also had had occasion to talk with one of the architects of this, with Egon Egon Barr, uh, the the disengagement policy, and he suffered from the accusation that this this policy did not. He, he didn't see. For instance, Solidarność in Poland, although we did have context to Solidarność, we, we obviously were, were, were uh, concerned about, uh, we, we, yeah, but, about these developments of societal concerns. And, and we, we would like to learn one or the other thing from these discussions. And when, when politics is learning, that is absolutely a very positive effect from, from, from certain failures to learn uh, from our past failures. We can take another round of three. How about uh, the gentleman next to the one in the red, the one in the pink, and then yourself in the blue? I'm uh, Peter Humphrey, intel analyst and a former diplomat. Clearly, there's going to be no Middle East peace solution without uh, addressing the settlements issue. It seems equally clear that uh, uh, Israel cannot do a land swap. Uh, the Shah's party would sooner burn down the Knesset than lose Israeli land, and the Palestinians are not going to accept a chunk of the Negev in exchange for the settlement territory. So we're stuck with either Israeli tanks pushing Jews back into Israel, or Jews becoming members of a new Palestinian state, if they wish. So if Israel can be 12% Israeli Arab, why can't the new Palestinian state be 5% Jews? Okay. Can we, Europe and the US, sit on the Palestinians to accept diversity in their new state? Um, we'll have the gentleman, we'll take the, we'll just take the round of questions and then uh, see what we can answer. The, so the gentleman in the pale pink. Hi, Connor Paul, a former student at Wake Forest University. Thank you guys for such an enlightened conversation today. But uh, I was wondering if you guys could address the human, uh, human rights response from Turkey in the Middle East, uh, given that they are the ones who have been Obviously, the Khashoggi murder occurred in the consulate there, but on top of that, recently they made the comment about the Uyghur population in China, which was very shocking, and also in the past few days, President Erdogan had a comment about Sisi and his regard for human rights in Africa. Now, in regarding that, Will, do you think that he's looking to fill a vacuum that the United States has left? Do you think he's using this as a chance to uh, insulate his regime, which certainly has their own human rights problems, which I think is the, probably the most interesting thing of his comments. And do you think that this provides a bigger opportunity for Europe to further their alliance with Turkey in regard to handling of the issues in the Middle East? Good question. And the gentleman in the blue shirt. In the, yeah. Hello, my, my name is Georg Heil. I'm a journalist from Germany for ARD Public Broadcaster. 
And um, I think Mr. Mitzenich just made a central point when he said that um, if, you, if you talk about terrorism, that there is uh, an explanation that uh, the Sunni population in Iraq uh, does not participate in power and, and that does not have stability and security within the current Iraqi government um, so, or society. So if you want to fight the roots of terror, the question would be, um, what can the U.S., what does the U.S. do, what does the European Union and Germany do in order to, uh, I don't know, put pressure on the Iraqi government uh, to, to include the Sunni part of the um, society? Okay. All good question. Okay, um, so maybe let's take um, any one of those that you'd like to take. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> easy questions, right? Maybe you want to address the issue of, of Israel, Palestine, and, and the settlements, and whether um, there's... Any well, I, address I, this issue of um, representation? You know, I, I think that there are a number of different uh, uh, formulas. And in fact, in, if you go back and look at where, um, where the Clinton administration was in, in 2000 and uh, the, the, um, the Camp David uh, negotiations in, um, in, uh, in 2000 and, and his final uh, pr approach in 2001, and this idea that there would be land swaps and that you would establish, um, you would establish uh, um, areas where you know the settlements would be incorporated into into Green Line Israel, and in exchange for which there would be an equivalent amount of territory that was ceded to uh, to the Palestinians. And I think, I think in principle that that was uh, the formula that both sides could find acceptable. I'm not uh, entirely sure that I accept the uh, predicate of your question, which is that the opposition to uh, uh, accepting a Jewish population in a Palestinian state that comes from the Palestinian side. I think it comes more from the Jewish side, mm -hmm. um, that they don't want to live in a, uh, uh, under a Palestinian leadership. Uh, but I think that the bottom line is probably neither side would accept it. And you're better off looking in terms of the settlement blocks and the, um, and the land swaps and uh, the fact that the settlements that are outside of the settlement blocks would have to be uh, abandoned. Uh, I think that that's the more likely scenario. Rolf, uh, do you want to take this question of, of Turkey, actually? I think it's quite um, interesting, particularly given uh, Germany's uh, perhaps not so smooth um, relationship with Turkey, especially over the last few years. Um, is Erdogan trying to, to fill a void or fill a vacuum, especially on the issue of human rights. In fact, but before I answer the question, I want to address your question whether Israel and Palestine, whether that wouldn't be possible. It's a great idea. And the great idea actually was born 100 years ago between Weizmann and King Saud, namely at the Paris Peace Conference or before the Paris Peace Conference, where it was possible, imagine that the region might accept to have different uh, population ethnic groups, whether they define themselves by religion or ethnicity, that they um, could live together. The question whether the two politicians meant it uh, is uh, open, but I think it's a good idea. And this morning, we also discussed the issue whether there are other than a two-state solution because the question of settlements and whenever Germany is tries to uh, pass a resolution on the settlements in the Security Council, I think this will no longer be possible what was possible during the Oslo talks or in uh, earlier talks. But we will continue to work on this issue. That is very clear. But let me tell you that at least for myself, I can say that very often I'm sort of um, w worrying because I don't have an answer. And I'm not really uh, optimistic that while during my lifetime, there's going to be a solution. Now, to the issue of Turkey, I think, yes. President Erdogan, who, even when he was a minister president, 
uh, did quite a bit uh, for Turkey. And this uh, is uh, linked in some manner to the negotiations about accession to the EU. And at the time, I think he decided for Turkey that due to the changes to the upheaval in uh, the Arab nations, the position of Turkey is different, is not uh, really next to the European nations, but much closer to being to the um, region that is the Central Asian nations. I just wanted to sort of highlight it uh, to uh, offer it as a key note, that is, my answer is yes. He is a placeholder, and he tries to have a stronger position. He feels himself to be a representative of the political Islam, of the Muslim Brotherhood, and therefore he thinks he can act more independently. Whether ultimately he'll be successful is something that I seriously doubt because the Turkish society tends to look towards Europe, not just in Istanbul or Ankara or Izmir, but also in other parts of the nation. But regarding the question of human rights, and to be very frank, this also applies uh, to me in Cologne, where my electoral district is, where we have 150,000 citizens from Turkey who came from Turkey in the 50s or 60s as a Gastarbeiter. And during the last May demonstration, I was asked to um, do something for a Cologne citizen um, who lived in a Cologne, who was visiting his uh, mother who had cancer. And when he visited his sick mother, he was uh, incarcerated. He was in uh, prison for 12 months. Um, I intervened for him, and uh, fortunately, he was released, but he cannot, uh, he's not allowed to leave Turkey. So you see that even a German parliamentarian is faced with the problems of Turkey. and. I must say that uh, I do not only find new friends uh, in my um, district who have different points of view and who are um, who have, among other things, threatened uh, me, and uh, so my human rights are impacted by the policy of Turkey too. This question of Iraq and uh, yeah. political inclusion of, uh, when it comes to the Sunni, mm. uh, Sunni representation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, well, you know, the, the, the question that you uh, asked was, was in, a, in a sense, a broader one than, than just Turkey, and it, it goes to um, counterterrorism policy and, and, and this fundamental issue of how you address the root causes of of terrorism, and uh, of course, yes, in the specific instance of, of Iraq, you've got a, um, an issue where the Sunni community after 2003 uh, was, in fact, um, uh, disenfranchised, was not able to, uh, to participate uh, in uh, the fundamental decision making, and as a result, uh, you had the rise uh, initially of Al Qaeda in Iraq, and then uh, that later uh, developed into uh, the Islamic State. Um, uh, but this political disenfranchisement, of course, is a, is a fundamental issue that affects uh, these issues of, of uh, terrorism and the rise of violent extremism throughout. Uh, you know, in my own experience in Yemen, uh, I would say that, again, uh, this was, uh, you know, one of the fundamental issues that, uh, that allowed al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula to develop and to, to be able to recruit uh, to be able to recruit uh, um, followers, and so, you know, uh, uh, one of the one of the issues, and one of the things that we talked about this morning was this whole uh, issue. Somebody was making the point of the over securitization of U.S. policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, extremism and and uh, and some of these things. And I can say um, that when I was working on counterterrorism ten years ago, twelve years ago. Uh, I think that there was a broad understanding that you had to address these very issues 
in order to eliminate the terrorist threat. Uh, you have to address the issue of institutional capacity building. You have to um, uh, address issues related to political disenfranchisement, economic marginalization, that you know, in order to develop sustainable um, counterterrorism policies going forward, uh, you have to address all of these root causes. And um, if you look at the Trump administration approach, um, it is very heavily focused on kinetic activities. You know, it's the elimination of the Islamic State and of the territory, uh, but not really very interested in uh, um, uh, an approach that emphasizes developmental issues. And so, and, and you see that, you see that in terms of their budget requests. Where do they want to put their money? Do they want to put their money into some of these issues? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. And that, I would say, and it goes back to your question, I would say that the result of that is that you get into these, uh, you know, you, you get into a situation where you, you're never going to get to a, a sustainable end to the conflict. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not just in the Middle East. You see that even in Africa. There's Absolutely. Been, uh, that's been Absolutely. a criticism. And, and look even at Colombia, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I think that that will be the last question we'll take, and I think we'll wrap up this conversation, this discussion. <laughs> Gerald, thank you so much. Rolf, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, guys, and thank you uh, for the Middle East Institute for having me and for the interesting thing for having me. Good. Thank you. Thank you.